<laughs> I know you had a chance to see it. How did that get it? Test good? Yes. Uh, Alright, so first we're going to go. Is this on Candice? I'm sorry. Is this on Candice? No. Yeah. Yeah, Will it be there later? I can put it there. Please.
So if we don't have space, if something's taking up our volume, such as infection, pus, blood, um, a number of things, mucus, any of that thing can take up our volume. We may have pneumonia, it may, our lung cancer if it's a tumor, right? Does that make sense? Okay. And then constriction. It's going to be your asthma and your bronchitis. That is more emphysema, pneumonia is more lower lung, like in your alveoli area. Cancer can be anywhere. Okay? And then your asthma and bronchitis are in your bronchioles, the upper lungs, and the tubes that go down to the sacs. And I've got more pictures to show you. Alright, so gas exchange, we, it takes place in the alveoli. We've got all these little grape-like little structures. Okay, those are alveoli at the end of these tubes, right? Well, in that grape-like structure, that's where oxygen enters and carbon dioxide diffuses out. We breathe it out, right? In, oxygen, out, carbon dioxide. So around that is our blood. So we're, the blood is diffusing through or allowing the carbon dioxide and oxygen through the wall of the alveoli, out, in, okay? Remember that? Just a basic, quick habit. All right, so concept transport, um, we're talking about the, well, transport could involve the blood. Um, it, it, perfusion might be another word to use for it too, but when we think about transport and perfusion, we're thinking about blood and we're thinking about oxygen getting to the alveoli, right, to make the exchange. If it can't get there, then the exchange can't be made, then the patient is or becomes hypoxic, right? What is hypoxic and hypoxemia? What's the difference between the two? Hypoxemia, emia, meaning blood, in the blood. Hypoxia, tissue. Hypoxemia, blood. It's low blood in the, it's low oxygen in the blood. Hypoxia is low oxygen in the tissue. So in saying that, how would we tell if there's low oxygen in the blood, what would be a definitive thing we could that could be done? Check their, check their, uh, see how much they're satin. Okay, satin's going to be more tissue. Oh, two sats are tissue. You got that one right. But what about the blood? Uh, the blood would be a ABGs. 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 Arterial blood gases. Yeah, arterial blood gases. ABGs tell us show the hypoxemia in the blood. Oh, two sats show us hypoxemia in the, hypoxia in the tissue, right? Yeah. Now got that straight, hypoxemia and hypoxia are two different words. And there's a difference. Which one is more definitive? How would, which one would be more, which one would be more useful in determining this patient's true status? ABGs. ABGs, blood. absolutely the blood. ABGs, for sure. Okay. All right, so some of the more concepts here. COPD, asthma, I got your disease processes over here, and then I've got the constriction, compliance, and volume. And we talk about gas exchange. All this must happen for gas to exchange, right? Mm -hmm. And then transport availability of the hemoglobin on the red blood cell. Remember, the hemoglobin has sticks to the red blood cell and it picks up the oxygen at the alveoli as it diffuses through. Okay? So if we don't have hemoglobin, red blood cells there, because, say, they're... H and H is low. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know what H and H is? Blood mm -hmm. Correct. If they're low, mm -hmm. we don't have enough red blood cells to carry oxygen. the molecules, the hemoglobin, then the patient could become hypoxic. So not only do we have to have oxygen in the alveolis, right? Mm -hmm. We also have to have blood to pick it up. A blood supply to pick it up. We're going to talk more about the blood supply when we get to level three and four. Okay? Right now, we're more concentrated on the oxygen getting to down to the alveoli. Okay. All right, so the things that these diseases, some things that you might, that or some concepts that you might see with these diseases, anxiety. If they're short of breath, are they going to be anxiety stricken? Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, every time. Every time. What about acid-base balance? How does that, how does these diseases affect acid-base balance? It increases the CO2 in here. Increases the PACO2, yeah, right, in, in the blood. 
The carbon dioxide in the blood, right? And it's acid. We say carbon dioxide in the blood is acid, acidic. Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen? The patient's going to come become respiratory, respiratory acidosis, um, right? Acidotic. I'm not going to get oxygen to their extremities. So acid base is affected by these, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfusion, same thing, all of them. Nutrition, super important. <laughs> A patient, all these cause shortness of breath. This is where the concepts are very simple. All of these cause shortness of breath, right? They can cause the patient to become hypoxic, hypoxemia, right? To have those two things. So all these patients are going to have problems with all these. <coughs> Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These patients are going to have problems with these. And we're going to talk more in depth about them. As we get. <coughs> All right, so physical assessment. Physical assessment, some of the things that we need to look at. And y'all guys should have went over that. Have y'all had physical assessment yet? Yeah, I know you had it in one, mm -hmm. but have y'all had the check off and all that yet? Mm -hmm. Not yet. All right, y'all have that at the end. Don't you closer to the end, I believe. Um, finger clubbing, barrel chest. Mm -hmm. Those two things you're going to see more with patients who are COPD but they're going to be chronic. They're not emergencies. Finger clubbing and barrel chest are not emergencies. Write that in your notes. Write that in your notes. <coughs> that is not an emergency. That is a patient who has been, who has had hypoxia or hypoxemia for an extended length of time, for a long time. That is not an emergency. Can we do anything to correct those two things? No. Nope. Can we manage them? Yes. Can we correct them? No. We cannot correct. So, dyspnea, shortness of breath. What do we do about dyspnea? Give them some oxygen. Mm -hmm. Give them some oxygen. Mm -hmm. What else? Sit incentive spirometer. Head of the bed up. Deep breathing. Mm -hmm. We'll talk more about the incentive spirometer specifically later on. But um, in this situation, if they're shortness, short of breath, I come, I'm entering a patient's room, they're having difficulty breathing. What is the first thing that I'm going to do? Put the head of the bed up. Make sure the head of the bed is sit up. Put that in your notes. Mm -hmm. Guys, if you listen and take notes, you'll be fine. You'll hear me repeat things twice. You'll hear me say, put that in your notes. I would write it down. It's important. All right, so set the head of the bed up is the first thing you're going to do. Okay? What am I going to do second? Apply oxygen. Um, check their O2. Oxygen. Check, check, check their O2. Check their O2 sap first before we apply oxygen. Mm -hmm. Let's see what it is. Because because they could just be having an anxiety attack. And we may not need oxygen. If they're having anxiety, sometimes patients would hyperventilate. They mm -hmm. get real short of breath, right? Mm -hmm. So it could be anxiety. So you have to determine, is this anxiety or is this truly shortness of breath? So let's get that O2 sap. So, O2 sat. Let's stop there for a minute, and we're going to repeat some of this as we go. O2 sat. What is a normal O2 sat? I think your book says 94, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. 94, 95 to 100, I think is what your book says. Well, this patient could be, if it's a, if it's a long-term COPD or somebody that's got that club, that clubbing fingers and that barrel chest. It's going to be low. Their normal, their normal could be lower. It could their be as low as 88%. Like mm -hmm. okay? It could be low as 88%. So you've got to know what their norm, their baseline. I can't stress that enough. Any vital signs that you are concerned about, you need a baseline. What was the patient running before? Because their blood pressure could be low, but that could be their norm. They're always low. Okay? Don't go call them doc and they're going to yell and scream at you. Well, Mr. Don, COPD, um, he's had COPD for 20 years, and, you know, his O2 stats are 88%. That's his normal. That's normal. That's likely normal. Okay? Um, so back to that O2 stat. Is O2 stat getting it on the finger, the ear? Sometimes we get them on the toes, wherever we can get a place to get them. Um, how reliable is that? Is it always reliable? No. So when is it not reliable? When their fingers are cold or they have nail polish on They're older. Okay. What else? I heard cold. Nail polish has to be removed. Um, they're older. Why when they're older? Yeah, 
Yes, very good. Circulation, so low blood pressure. If they have low blood pressure, then your pulse box may not be accurate. If they have low blood pressure, you can expect it not to be accurate. If they have low blood pressure. Cold hands. What do we do for cold hands? Warm them up. Warm them up. Do we put them in? Do we get a towel and put it in the microwave? No. Uh, no. No. Never put anything in the microwave. Don't we'll burn the patient, right? We never put anything in the microwave. You're going to see it done. It's not the right thing to do. It's not the right thing to do. Okay. Orthopedia. What's orthopedia? I heard somebody say it back in the back. Difficulty breathing when laying down. Difficulty breathing when laying down. So when you lay down, what happens to the stomach contents first? Let's talk about them. They're come back up. it in there, right? Really tight. There's a lot of pressure. So when you lay down, Comes gravity what? Go back up. Pushes it upward, correct? And this also, when you talk about acid reflux, same concept, is you've got, you've got all this pressure from the stomach when you're laying down, it's pushing upward. So less space for air to enter, correct? Mm -hmm. So they're not getting oxygen as well, so shortness of breath is going to be worse when they're laying down. So what are we going to do for them? Sit them up. Sit them up. Sometimes they like to sit up and have the bedside table over them and put their arms this way. Okay, so something about this back area opens up more space. You've got more space back here for the lungs, and we'll talk more about this when we get to four too, about turning prone for some patients. That's when you've got more space and they breathe better when they're moving like this. Some can tolerate it, some cannot. You kind of have to work within the scope of what the patient can tolerate. That's called the tripod position. Tripod. Tripod position. You got in your group. Okay, okay. what's tachypnea? Fast breathing is all that is. All right, so what is, well, cough and sputum, pretty simple. Let's talk about that for a minute. What kind of sputum would be expected with somebody that had lung disease? Clear. Uh, it could be clear, but it's, pro it's going to be increased. If they have some kind of disease going in, their mucus is going to be increased. It could be clear. We want it clear, don't we? Yes. What if it's yellow or green? Infection. Infection. What if it's bloody? Irritation. Um, some type of bleeding, right? It could be irritation. Could it be cancer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be. It could be. So we want clear. But remember, they're going to have more mucus. They're going to have more mucus. So if the patient's dry and they have all this mucus, what's it going to do to the airway? So what do we need to encourage? Fluids, he said it. Fluids, fluids. We need it. Yeah, cough and deep breathing is important. It's important with this patient. So I don't want you to tell you it's not important, but I, I specifically said that they're they're not getting enough fluids. They're dehydrated, so they need fluids. So I don't care how much medicine you give a patient that's thin mucus, if they don't have fluids on board, it's not going to work. Okay, it's not. It's not going to work. So you've got to give them some fluids. You got to encourage fluids. <coughs> now. There comes a time when fluids are not, not something that is good for the patient. What if they have CHF? Have y'all talked about that in cardiac? Mm -hmm. yep. Congestive heart failure? So this patient with congestive heart failure may not be somebody we can give fluids to, right? That may not be an option for us, for that patient. So maybe we can do some chest physiotherapy or the respiratory therapist can do that for the patient. All right, so let's see what we have. Chest pain. Why would they have chest pain? They're chronically coughing. Mm -hmm. They're chronically coughing, so those muscles are getting sore. They're overused, right? Mm -hmm. What would be another reason they could have chest pain? The buildup of blood <coughs> in there is just pressure. Pressure. Okay. What else? <coughs> what is it? You lack of oxygen to the heart muscle. That's exactly right. Super important to know that. So could they be, could, are they having a heart attack, an MI, or is it simply from the disease process? Okay, so is it important if a patient's having chest pain and you're not sure, 
what the baseline is and what they've been doing and what it's from, that they have a cardiac workup. So call the doctor, you call the doctor, right? Driving chest pain. Wheezing is another thing that a lot of these asthma patients have. Some COPDers have it. When you see wheezing, it's constriction of the airways. You see it with asthma and bronchitis because, remember we talked about those two being in the upper, in those little tubes, the bronchioles, that bring the air, allow the air to get down to the alveoli. The mucosa in there gets inflamed, irritated, and swollen. So instead of it being open like this, it's more like this. So air is pushing through there, and it's causing this musical sound. Okay, that's your reason. Okay, so a lot of times when you have crackles, while we're here, we'll do, talk about it again. While we have crackles, what is crackles? What is that indicating the blood? Blood, you said something like that, correct? So if I've got a patient with crackles, if I've got a patient with crackles, I've, I'm listening to them, I hear some crackles, what, am I going to run and tell the doctor? No, have them cough, deep breathe first and cough, and then listen again. Listen again. Sometimes it's just the mucus that's in there that's stuck, and when they deep breathe and cough, it comes loose and comes up. And those crackles are gone. That sound's gone. Okay, so make sure it's true crackles before you call the physician. Write that down. So, just generally speaking, on a test. Okay. Well, if I if you had a question um and the, you're you're hearing crackles, what would you do? Some of them be like recheck. You always recheck, always before you call the doctor. You always recheck first. If you hear crackles, you always recheck. Have them deep breathe, cough first, and then always always recheck. Even if I heard crackles yesterday. And I'm back today for another shift. Still gonna do the if same I'm hearing crackles, I'm going to have them do the same thing but, and then listen again. So if they got a lot of mucus in there just trying to come up, you might hear a lot of crackles going on. And they can just deep breathe and cough one good strong time and then they may be gone. Okay? So that's how I'm going to compare it to yesterday and every time. Okay? <laughs> All right, so hemophysis is your bleeding. So that's the word for what? Coughing up blood. Mm -hmm. Hemophysis. Coughing up blood. So if you don't have a term book, a good thing to do, and you may have already gotten the suggestion, is as you're reading and going through this stuff, is to make you a term book, like write down hemophysis, what it is, and just keep that in a book, maybe in alphabetical order. And when you come across it again, you can flip to your book and from time to time review it. That'll help get those terms in your, you know, in your vocabulary. And use them. Use them in clinical. Synopsis. Or sinosis, sorry. Sinosis. What is that? Blue. 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 That's blue. That's blue. So I've got a patient that has hypoxemia. I've got a patient with hypoxemia. Where's the first? If I don't see any blueness anywhere on the extremities, where am I going to look? What's the first place I'm going to look for blueness? There. I thought it was the mucosa. It's in the mucosa. It's in the mouth. The mouth. Yeah. That's the number one place. That's where you're going to see it. That's the most reliable. The specific words. That is the most reliable place for you to in, or to determine if the patient is cyanotic. The most reliable place is in the mouth for cyanotic patient to determine if they're cyanotic is the mouth. All right. Now remember, you're going to look in the mouth. That's the number one place. You wrote it down. You started that. But in just general talk, and remember that when blood, when we don't have enough oxygen, blood is, and oxygen is always shunted to what? The major organs. Mm -hmm. So what will be the next thing to turn blue? Your fingertips. Your extremities. extremities and toes. The legs and the hands and the fingers, right? Mm -hmm. You'll see it there first because all of the blood and oxygen is going to go for the brain, the heart, right? The other organs that you have in your trunk area. Okay, let's see. So risk factors for patients who have diseases are smoking, environmental exposure to chemicals, maybe in their workplace. Um, we have a lot of that around here, right? We have Ingalls and we have what, Chevron and among other industrial places that um, people may be, our workers may be exposed to chemicals over a period of time that damages lung tissues, okay? And they can end up with COPD. 
So can a patient get pneumonia if they have a chemical exposure? Mm -hmm. They can. They can, absolutely. So family history is important too. Um, with COPD, there is some type of genetic link. They think they're not, it's not proven yet, but they think there is some type of genetic link. So but we do know that smoking and chemicals, any kind of inhalant injuries will be a problem. Um, people who paint cars, I'm giving you other examples. Paint cars, they inhale those fumes if they're not wearing a respirator. Mm -hmm. Could be one example. People who paint, painters, right? Mm -hmm. are constantly exposed to fumes. What about people who clean their house? What about us? We clean our house, right? Mm -hmm. So what about the chemicals? Could it cause us a problem over a lifetime? Oh, yeah. It could. It definitely could. That's why there, you see all these natural things on TV about no chemical free to clean your house. Vinegar, they're saying vinegar is a good thing. And they can say that. All right, so this is a picture of your club's nail. Look at your nail. Look at your neighbor's nail. And then look at that nail. Compare it to that nail. Do you see the difference in the degree? How it's rounded? Love, well, rounded. Ours is what? Uh, straight out. Okay. So, again, this is a patient who has long term oxygen or decreased oxygen, hypoxemia or hypoxia. Okay. <coughs> There's your barrel chest. I've got better pictures, I believe, somewhere in there so you can see it better. What happens with the barrel chest? You know, we're always, our chest is wider from arm to arm than it is front to back, right? Well, what happens with that, and we're going to talk more about the actual path though behind it, but the chest becomes the same diameter front to back as it is arm to arm. So it's more kind of like a round, like a barrel looking chest. Okay. And again, that's long term. Hypoxemia, and both of those things are not an emergency. All right, there's your healthy versus unhealthy. Huge difference. Okay, this is your smoker, your non smoker. Okay, assessment breath sounds. Y'all guys remember in this whole assessment how to do that? I've got a slide on here to show you. You, you can't just go one, two, three, four. That is not getting all of the lungs, all the surface area that you need to listen to. Something could be going on in one lung, and if you miss that lung and you don't hear it, then the patient could be, what, could crash on you. All right, so vascular is soft. Bronchovascular, y'all remember, is intermediate, and then bronchial is loud. Bronchial is going to be up here. Tracheal is going to be up here, closer up here, right? Trachea, mm -hmm. tracheal. Bronchial over the bronchial, correct? Make sense? Okay. As you go down, it gets quieter. Alright, so there's your site. This is our agar book. Not an icky. There's your site. So it's not just four, but they have 25 on here. So if I'm doing a focus assessment, say the patient has something respiratory going on, I'm going to do a focus assessment on that system, right? I'm going to do all of these. If I'm doing a bedside assessment, I'm going to do eight on the back and two on the sides and two in the front or four in the front okay i won't be doing 25 i'll be close that side's a little different we down a little down a little bit if we're doing a focus because they have a respiratory issues and then 25 is very appropriate <coughs> okay very appropriate okay here's your areas this is your long diagram so this is what i'm listening to some of the front and the back here you see that mm -hmm. on the sides so you kind of get where you need to place your stethoscope to listen by looking at that. That's pretty accurate. Okay? That one's at 82, right? This one's not. I don't know what this is. This is not. All right, so let's listen to some long sales. Let me see if I can get this to work. So you're not going to come right out of nursing school and recognize every single sample. Good, you're not, and that's okay. <laughs> we don't expect you to. However, we do expect you to recognize normal. So if you know it's not normal, then you're going to come get another nurse or instructor or wherever you're at, what situation you're in, to come listen with you to find out what it is if you're not sure what it is. Okay? So you're not going to know every sound, but you need to know normal. So the more lungs you listen to, the more hearts you listen to, the better off you are when you get out of school. You'll be, be more apt to recognize that one.
and this is not working, but you'll have this link to go on and here's all your sales. And there's a lot of other websites out there too, and YouTube is probably one of the best places to go and pull up bread sounds and it will give you the same what they sound like. So crackle is just kind of like their crackles um, or like Rice Krispie. Have you ever heard Rice Krispie when you put milk on it, right? It's kind of crackles. Um, so I'm going to let you guys look at that. If you're having trouble with the links, let me know. Maybe that the link's expired. I use it. I've used it for a while. But anyway, like I said, you can go on YouTube. There's other sites out there that you can hear those sounds and listen to them and understand what they are. Wizards that musical and said that crack um, crackles is basically like rice krispies. Diagnostic test. So what are we going to do for these folks? What kind of diagnostic test can we, can we anticipate, I should say, the physician order? Because we're not a chest x-ray for one. A chest x-ray is probably one of the most ordered ones. Chest x-ray, one of the most ordered ones. What's PFTs, pulmonary function tests? What are those really? Breathing tests. Okay, mm -hmm. they're breathing tests, but what kind? More specific Like detail. a stress breathing test? Will they make them all for doing anything like that? Capacity of the lungs, right, absolutely. It tests the capacity of the lungs, the volume and capacity of the lungs. So you do not need to know all of the PFT findings or norms, numbers. Okay, it's good to know what PFTs is and what you can explain to the patient what's going to happen. They put them in this booth and they give them this mouthpiece and they blow into this machine. Sometimes they ask them to hold their breath. Okay, pretty much that's it. There's no anything invasive at all <coughs> to this test. A lot of blowing, it does wear the patient out because they're already usually short of breath anyway, mm -hmm. right? So things that we do not want the patient to have before they go to this test are what? Respiratory common germs. What is it? What, what do we don't want to give the patient before they go for this Meds test? that are going to decrease their respiration. Med, they're going to, yeah, pain meds. Meds are, meds are going to decrease respirations, which would be pain meds mm -hmm. too. Any sedatives? Um, what about a bronchodilator? So is it going to give us false readings? Yeah. Absolutely. It'll open it. Absolutely. We don't want them to have any of their inhalers. We don't want them to be on to have steroids. This is going to give us false readings, right? So we want to ask the physician. I see that Mrs. So and So has some prednisone ordered, and you've got PP um, PFTs ordered. Do you want to hold this? Is this something we want to hold, or do you want to do the test? Sometimes I've seen them do the test with the steroids on board um, because they've been taking them a long time. They've had them for a while, so it's not something you want to stop. <coughs> All right. So arterial blood gases, we're going to talk more about that when we get in three and four. Okay, we're going to talk about how those are obtained, who obtains them, and what they are. What you need to know, what you need to know is going to be the results. It's the things you learned in blood and electrolytes when y'all talked about ABGs, mm -hmm. PaO2, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I've got a slide to show you the rest of But you need to know all those things, your bicarb, right, your pH, your carbon dioxide, and your PAO2. What's a PAO2? Mm -hmm. Oxygen level in the blood. Oxygen is the partial pressure oxygen level in the blood. Okay? And that's going to come from your ABG. So remember we took O2 sat tissue, right? Mm -hmm. ABGs for blood, blood. To, to tell if they're hypoxemia, they have hypoxemia. And your PAO2 is going to be the level. So look up these. If you don't know what a PAO2 is, make sure you write it down, look that up, and look up the norms. I think your book says 90 to 100, 80 mm -hmm. to 100, somewhere in there. That's pulse ox? No. The PAO2 is your partial oxygen in your blood. So the pulse ox is going to be what we put on the finger. The PAO2 is what we're going to get from the ABG results. Okay? Everybody good? All right, cultures and sputum studies. Cultures and sputums, you see that a lot with pneumonia. Patient with pneumonia, we want to know what the organism is so we can use the correct antibiotics. So they may do a sputum, a sputum sample, right? So they may do um, what's called uh, a wash, where they go in and they put liquid into the lung, a little wash, and suck it back out and to see if there's any cancer cells in there. They may do a biopsy, a needle biopsy, through the lung to take out some. 
They may do a wedge biopsy where they pull out a wedge or a chunk of lung to look at. So all of the above they needs to be put to sleep, need, right? Hmm? I said all those need to be put to sleep, right? Yes. yes, they get some kind of sedatives. Not all of them are put to sleep, but they do get some kind of sedatives. We're actually going to walk, if it comes up, we're going to watch a bronchoscope. And you'll see they just give them sedatives for that mm -hmm. as well. It's a patient actually having the procedure. It's pretty cool. We hope we get it come up. Um, just makes me gay. So, bossies can be a number of things. They can do a bronch. Go down and look inside the lungs and the iron down the, the alveoli. And they really don't see the alveoli. They see more the bronchioles. Okay? But they can the bigger pull samples. Stuff. They can send these tools down and pull samples out. So that's one way they can do that. Um, so imaging, chest x-rays, CT scans, MRIs, VQ, big, big Q scans. We're going to talk more about ventilation and perfusion because remember we said we're going to talk about blood more in three and four. So VQ scans just show us, it's like a scan that shows us their ventilation perfusion. Okay, that they're having how much blood's getting there, how much oxygen's getting there. That's all that is. All right, so endoscopic bronch is our, what's on our objectives, correct? Mm -hmm. So patients going for a bronch or bronchoscope, <laughs> what are some things that we're going to do or ensure that's done for this patient before they go? Mm -hmm. if, well, if it's outpatient, do they have a ride because we're giving them some sedatives, right? Mm -hmm. MPO. MPO, what else? Informed consent, super important. Do we get the informed consent signed? No, we never, never, ever, ever get a form consent sign. We do not. That's a physician role. Are you going to see it happen? Yes, you're going to yeah. see it happen. Is oh. it right? No. If something happens, that patient could come back, or family, and sue the nurse and the physician and the institution. We do not ever, ever, ever get an informed consent sign, but we do. Our role Witness is to ensure that it's signed the will. and that okay. the patient knows what's going to happen. So and after the physician gives all the risk benefits, everything mm -hmm. to the patient, we're not allowed to have the patient sign it? If you're in the room with the physician, you can hand it to them, but if physician, technically the physician's getting them to sign it, you are not. But if the physician's not in the room, no. No. You cannot. That is not in your scope. That's not going to be in your practice act. Your nurse, the nurse practice act for you to do that. Yeah. We have yeah. Okay. Yeah. If what, for what? That we were responsible for witnessing it, but we're not responsible for explaining it. We're not supposed to explain it, but we're supposed to obtain the it's We're supposed to get it signed. You're going to make sure that it's signed, but you're not going to get it signed. You're make sure There's it's signed, difference. but you're not signing it. Look up your schedule. No, we're not going to sign it, but right. it's our duty. It's your duty to make sure that it's signed and it's in the chart. Right. Yes. But you are not getting it signed. Yeah, we're not Correct. You're not getting it signed. So we're good? If, yes. if they're signing, they're actually signing that paper, the physician needs to be in the room. You don't need to be in the room without the physician in there because the physician technically has to have the person sign the paper. In their vision. Mm -hmm. With them watching, right? With them watching, they should be. That's technically how it works. But See, we were not always. Ready. Sometimes they leave it in the room and the nurse has to go behind and pick it up, and that's okay. Oh, okay. That's okay, but you're not watching the patient sign it. The physician has to do that. But if I'm going in the room to pick this consent up. And it's not signed, you don't worry about it. You get the doctor right. If it's not signed, I'm not going to ask the patient to sign it. I'm just going to walk out of the room because it's not my place. Mm -hmm. And then I and but I will ask the patient, I said, do you did you get all the information that you need about this procedure? Do you know the risk? Do you know the benefits? And did the physician explain this to you? And if they say no I don't, I'm going to call the physician. And it's not they they do, do, do what? And if they say that they do understand then you would attain the sickness, right? And they could they could sign it if they wanted to, but I'm not gonna ask them to sign it. Because if I say you need to sign your consent, then that's me telling them that they need to sign their consent and they may not be ready. Does that make sense? I'm directing them to yeah. sign that consent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can say, I need that consent on the chart before you go for the procedure. But I'm not going to say, sign your consent. Do you see the difference? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. if a family witnessed that and something happens, then technically I'm, it's my fault. I'm going to be drawn into that too. Mm -hmm. But if I say, we need this consent, before you go for your procedure, 
understand. I'm just saying what we need, what I need. My role is to get the consent, make sure it's on the chart. But my role is not to have the patient sign it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. All right, let's move on. I got off into it. All right, biopsies um, is another thing. I think we talked a little bit about biopsies, and you're going to see that more. So there's the PFT machine. They do pinch their nose. I forgot to tell you that. They do pinch their nose so they don't blow or lose any air or suck any air in their nose. They're just strictly their mouth are using. Okay? So that's what they're doing right there. There's your ABGs. It always comes out of the artery in the wrist. Has any of you seen those drawn? Mm -hmm. It can come off an A-line. And probably most of you may not know what that is. It's an arterial line. Um, it could be in the foot, the groin area, but sometimes they'll pull that blood off that arterial line or an A-line that measures blood pressure. And you'll, mm -hmm. you'll get more of that when you get to three and four. What do you need to know about ABGs? The levels. The levels. The levels. The levels. Do I need to know every single level? No. Nope. Just the Just ones that we're talking about, right? The ones that I learned in fluid <laughs> electrolytes. Mm -hmm. And the norms that you learned in fluid electrolytes are the norms we're going to use. So go back and pull those out. I'm not going to sit here and tell you because my norms are a little bit off <coughs> than what your book says. And I'm sure she gives you the books. Did y'all have a picture of this picture? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She gave you the books, book results, or the book norms. Use those norms for testing. Okay? Use those for testing. All right, so a two stop. So. This is your little portable one, but you can have what's called a continuous, and it's just a little like metal clip, and it goes on their finger, and we tape that on their finger, and the wire goes over here to a machine on their bedside, and it prints out their heart rate, or it doesn't print out, but it shows their heart rate, and it shows them what their O2 side is. That's called continuous pulse ox, mon pulse ox monitoring, okay? So we can continuously do that. Um, you'll see that a lot in recovery. I know y'all guys go to what, surgery? You'll see that recovery in the operating room, those places. Um, you may see it at the bedside too, depending on what's going on with the patient. Okay, so that's just a chest x ray there. All right, perfusion. Okay. There we go, there's your bronch. That's what you're interested in, what's on your objectives, right? Your bronch. Okay, so that's what it looks like. We'll look more at that later. What is this? Draining of the fluid on your lungs. What's that called? Um, no, it's a, a chest tube. It's a, same principles as a chest tube, though. It's energy and fluid from the lungs. Um, it empties fluid from the pleural space. From the pleural space. It's called thoracentesis. Is that on my objectives? Yeah. Or, mm -hmm. um, what? So I'm not worried about that. I just remembered no, what it was. You'll get that later on, but I just threw it up there to know that if a patient gets fluid, you know, on their lungs or in that pleural space, but you can do a thoracentesis and pull out, you may sit that in clinicals. So that's why I threw it up there. You may see that done. If you get an opportunity to go watch this, go watch it. It's awesome. All right, so this is a collection specimen. We have a patient whose cough is not forceful enough. They can't <clears throat> cough forceful enough to get mucus up. And we really, really need some mucus so we can see what's going on with them. So what this does is one end of it goes from the patient or suction from the patient and the other end goes to the suction source. So when it comes into from the patient, it'll come into this little collection tube here and it'll stop. It'll get stuck there. So we can get our sample. We can take that off and then go back to the straight line suction. So you'll see respiratory therapists use this a lot. Respiratory therapists use this. Guys, respiratory therapists are your friends. If you have respiratory patients, they are your friends. If you've got a patient crashing or coding, they're your best friend. Mm -hmm. Okay? They're your best friend. Keep them close. So Keep them close. We would just need to know to contact respiratory if we couldn't get, but not necessarily how to Yeah, if I couldn't get, well, if I couldn't get a suction or a sample, I would contact respiratory. Yeah, I call respiratory if I couldn't get a, a sample. And usually the doctor knows and he'll ask respiratory to collect. They usually know that. All right, so take a minute, take a piece of paper out real quickly and see if you can guess these real fast and then we'll take a break and then get done. This is what the things, these are the things that you need to know the levels for, right here for ABG. These are the things you need to know the levels for. It'll be your bicarb, right? Your carbon dioxide, your pH, and then your PaO2, which we talked about, oxygen level, 
in the blood. These are the things you need to know the levels for. So we're matching them? Yes, yeah. you're matching mm -hmm. these. Also, you're making a note out beside it that these are what you need to know these things. All right, I'm going to leave this up and let you go ahead and go to break and come back at 11, um, and we'll resume right here. Okay?